Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 385th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. If you listen closely, you may hear my five-year-old screaming in the bathtub as my 19-year-old gives her a bath. But I digress. That's not why you chimed in to listen. Um, had a little vacation last week, went to the mountains with the family for a few days. My wife stayed for a whole week. But it was nice not having any set schedule because I blanked out the whole week. So it's quite refreshing. Got a few episodes ahead. Uh, today I had two great guests, uh, but you won't hear from them for almost two months. But um, got into artificial intelligence, how to use that not only uh, like as a robot, like a spider, you know, doing magical things behind the scenes, but actually helping humans that work for you even on a contract basis, uh, provide better real-time support on the phone uh, and in chat. So uh, some cool things there. Um, had a guy on uh, from here in Southern California that is using, he calls it small data instead of big data. Uh, he's basically kind of like a list broker, but he helps you get accurate information because we talked about what is working today in business. Is cold calling working? Is direct mail working? Is email working? Uh, and we've seen this trend. I've had multiple guests on recently uh, that you've heard us talk about. Direct mail does still work. Cold calling does still work. Email marketing is less efficient and effective than it used to be. It's the easiest platform to ignore. So just constantly uh, I'm seeing reaffirmation, confirmation of that, which is why I've always said you've got to provide multimedia, multi-step marketing to reach decision makers, right? To reach the ideal people uh, that you need to close to grow your business. If you're relying on just one means, one method, then you are vulnerable. And my goal always with this podcast, with all the work that I do, is to keep you from being vulnerable. You know, uh, and actually, with the guy that I had on, we were talking uh, after we turned off the recording, but um, how to get great people, how to get great salespeople. Uh, I've had um, a sponsor here for a while now, several months. Uh, we're coming up to the end uh, of this first trial, which has been good. Uh, but if you're looking for great salespeople in the big cities, they're only in a couple of big cities now, uh, but check out the saleswhisper.com slash recruit. Okay, the folks over at Rainmakers, they find great salespeople with the intent to move. They're not just trying to beat up their own current uh, people to get a raise. These are folks looking to make a switch. And because they have this proprietary system of bringing in the candidates in waves, right, every two weeks, uh, you as the hiring company have to act quickly but so do the candidates so it's a win-win if you're a candidate uh, it's free to use if you are a company looking to hire uh, it is not free to use but you will save money and more importantly you will save time um, it costs over two thousand dollars a day when you have a salesperson not in the seat uh, and that's based on a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar a year um, sales quota uh, and in those big cities, that ain't nothing. So check it out, the saleswhisper.com slash recruit if you're looking to hire great salespeople. If you are a great salesperson and you want to get greater, you want to sharpen the edge, you want to stay sharp, you want to pick my brain uh, just to make sure uh, you're on the right track, uh, check out 30daysalesgrowth.com. Come join right now, uh, right now still a one-time payment and you'll have lifetime access to the content and the group um, otherwise pretty soon it's going to turn to a subscription model um, but you can join now as I'm porting over all the content join get the on-demand content ask your questions in the group and I will answer them okay 30daysalesgrowth.com help you sell mo better now we're going to jump into why you should be podcasting with Michael Greenberg Michael Greenberg running callforcontent.com, the podcasting agency all the way from Denver, Colorado. Welcome to the sales podcast, man. How the heck are you? Doing great. How about yourself, Wes? I'm good. So, man, where were you when I got started umpteen years ago, huh? Are you 
really Probably doing this? Are you, knowledge. are you producing, monetizing growth and advertising for people wanting to uh, get into the podcast realm? I am indeed. Uh, we started out of B2B content marketing, actually. And then about nine months ago, moved to saw the success we had with podcasts there. Started working on our first case study. Uh, launched white label podcasting for agency partners. And then said, man, this podcast thing is working. Let's go all in. <laughs> so you, All right, so hold on. You're talking about you were doing content for B2B. Can you elaborate on that? Because believe it or not, not everybody may know what that means. Yeah, I mean, my hope is that just about nobody knows what it means because <laughs> when I... When I went into audit marketing teams, it certainly seems like they don't. Um, no offense to the marketers who might be listening, but the sales guys <laughs> get authority. Um, and that's, that's where we started is B2B content marketing is about lead generation and positioning your organization for success in the market. And that means creating content that supports the sales process. Because in B2B, when you're selling a $15,000 service package or you're selling a $200,000 enterprise software package, it's about relationships and there are touch points involved. It's not like uh, e-commerce or something like that where people can just click buy online. These are complex sales uh, and these are big numbers. And so the content you develop it looks very different. And that means blogs is where we started, was with blogs and ebooks. And then we realized it's so much easier if you just start with an interview of the subject matter expert or get the customer to host a show themselves even better and create content from that. And so that's how we got into podcasting. Huh. All right. So does the does all that still work? And you're just recommending podcasting as as a, another leg on the stool? Uh, are you are you putting all of your uh, focus now behind podcasting instead? Or are you just starting there? So we start there. Okay. We do what's called podcast first now. So uh -huh. we'll create a podcast and then we'll use the content from that podcast. We'll transcribe it and use it to create the blogs and the eBooks and everything that comes afterwards. So, um, so you'll take a client uh, I always pick on a chiropractor because that's uh, a friend of mine is a client who is a chiropractor, uh, but it's also, um, I think if it works for them, it can work for anybody because people are like, oh, my business is different. You know, it's like, well, here's a guy limited a little bit by healthcare regulations and whatever and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So would you, would you take on a, a chiropractic client and have them start a podcast or would you simply interview them and maybe distribute that interview to like healthcare type podcasts? You see where I'm going? I'm just trying to understand yeah. the process yeah, so the because that chiropractor may or may not want to start a podcast. Yeah. And the chiropractor having a local business like that might not benefit in the same way from some of the things that we do with podcasting. Okay. I should specify a local business with a fairly low value per customer in comparison to say an accounting firm. Okay. Um, and so we, for, to stick with the chiropractor, we'd likely place them on a few shows uh, to get some information from them. Okay. And then we'd take a look alongside that and see, okay, is this chiropractor, is the target market for this chiropractor listening to podcasts? Okay. And from that, we would then either see, yes, they are. Okay, we're developing a show for them to actually listen to, and we're going to promote that to that audience. Or, no, they aren't. Okay, we're developing a show for SEO. We're developing a show that's going to be focused on traffic generation and content generation for their business but we're not going to assume that the show is part of the actual plan to gain customers. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the idea being that when we start with the show, when we start with that audio content, it's cheaper for us to produce all the written content down the line. Okay. Uh, now, couldn't a, 
even though they are local, even though, you know, it is the chiropractor with this smaller local audience, um, couldn't it still help them kind of become a celebrity in a way? Oh, yeah. Uh, even just interviewing like local, it, it forces them to kind of get out of their own head a little bit, right? And expand because now they're becoming, you know, they're going to interview the, the pizza shop owner in the same strip mall. Uh, but he may have an interesting story. And if the, if the chiropractor gets good at, at interviewing, I mean, you can pull a good story out of just about anybody. Yeah. Uh, and now you're like this, you're this pillar of the community, helping people get the word out, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, okay. A dude in New York probably is not going to fly to your Belinda, California to get his neck adjusted. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, uh, I've heard of, of hairdressers charging $600 and $1,200 and people flying across country to get their hair done. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and what's to prevent that chiropractor from creating a DVD series or, you know, an online course, you know, how to can oh, take control absolutely. of your own health. And from your Belinda, he can sell that to New York. And that's exactly what we'd recommend if that chiropractor wanted to go after that market. Okay. Um, where we see really good... When we look at the locally focused stuff in particular, the markets we see that do really well with are professional services, uh, where you really can build that community and weave yourself in. And so that might be insurance. Real estate brokers have been quite successful with that. Um, and accounting firms, as I mentioned before, have been another good one. So anywhere where you can use the podcast, and this is the real key, is when we can use the podcast and have on people who would make great customers or great partners, then the podcast has a really nice direct line to generating relationships. Right. And at the end of the day, the business we're in is the business of building relationships. That's the core function for any business in b2b and in profession yeah i mean a while ago i had um i'm drawing a blank on her last name i'll look it up but anna and she was she's the queen of repurposing content and it sounds like that's what you're doing you're starting with the podcast right so you've got the audio and then you can get it transcribed so you've got a blog post an article and if you do video like this even like with zoom you could uh, you'll have a video that you can reproduce, pull snippets out, sizzle reels and whatever, right? Yeah. And that repurposing really is the name of the game. Yeah. Uh, that's why we like audio to start with is because once you factor in a whole content plan, if you start with audio, it's one of the best formats for repurposing and the lowest cost to produce for repurposing that we've found. Do you use the video as well? It depends if we have video. Okay. Um my big issue with video is that it gets costly to edit. Um, and Well, how, how much editing and like polishing do you really need? I mean, do you recommend, and maybe it depends on the industry. You know, I do a lot of videos with my iPhone sitting in that leather chair right back there. Yeah, um, it, com it, does, it comes down to industry and preference. You okay. know, I have some clients who only want to shoot video once a month. They want to go in, have a professional videographer set up it run some studio space and set up that whole thing because they're not going to do it without hair and makeup. Um, <laughs> but I've got others. If somebody is willing to shoot from their phone, if they'll do the quick videos, that works well. And what we do is we create the audiograms now, uh, the little snippets from podcast interviews, uh -huh. and use either a static image or some stock video, combine that with the quote. And so then we create video, even if we have none to begin with. Gotcha. Um, are you finding those work pretty well? Like, are you putting them out like, like little one minute things on Instagram and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing good responses from those and we're actually getting ready to run a whole bunch of tests with them over starting here in May and then planning out over Q3 uh, 2019. We're going to be testing and figuring out exactly what the best formats are for those and then publishing all those results uh, as well. Interesting. Um, so, so you don't think the podcast market is topped out yet? No. Um, I think people are doing things all the time and they want content to listen to when they do it. Right. 
Um, if you look at, I like to look to the Chinese market to see an example of a more developed podcast market. Really? Yeah. They're, well, they're several times the size of our podcast market. Oh. Primarily self-help and like personal development shows. And gotcha. they're almost exclusively funded by subscriptions. Ah. So we see podcasting in large part as part of something to help you sell more courses, sell more info products, build and really develop a deep conversation with your audience. And so long as people are building audiences, podcasts are going to be part of it from now on. And when I say podcast, I'm really expanding out to all the different kinds of streaming audio and long form video options that fall in that category. Because it really, you know, podcast is a word that means nothing on its own. So what are they doing in the Chinese market? I mean, is it, uh, are they charging like very low amounts, you know, so it's easy for somebody to subscribe? Are they charging higher amounts uh, yeah, to have more of an exclusive generally. kind of audience? So, I mean, if you're getting a couple of dollars a month from, you know, two or 3,000 audience members, you've got a solid show going at that point. Sure. That's, that's bigger than most. That's more money than most podcasts will make through the entire lifetime of their show. <laughs> right. Um, and they're building with that model from the beginning. So maybe you're putting out one episode a week to the public, but you might have another two episodes that dig in on those topics that are only for your community. Oh, I see. So, so you're doing three a week, let's say. And on the one that's live, that's kind of the teaser or the feeder into, and we're going to more detail. If you want to know even more, you know, become a subscriber and get access to this premium content that only our members get, that sort of thing. Exactly. And we've started to see audio courses come back along with that sort of stuff. So... You may remember, you know, the Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins CDs from back in the day. Yeah. And audio cassettes before that. <laughs> I used to go, I've been to those uh, success seminars back in the day with, um, I think it was Colin Powell and uh, Norman Schwarzkopf. And I mean, I've seen people like that live, you know, in Houston when I was younger, yeah. uh, making their rounds. And you those remember those, do you? You probably watch it on the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, those were <laughs> a little earlier than me. But I got lucky to have a client who said, Hey, I think it's time to make an audio course. And he he's going towards the end of his career now. But he's he realized and he saw that audio was coming back. And yeah. so Oh, people he, all the time. I, I finally have it on my calendar to to do an audio version of my book and I've done the first couple of chapters actually as podcasts awesome. um, to kind of tease people, right? Lead them in. And, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make the audio because people tell me, and I notice like my own consuming. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to audio books. I love written books. I mean, I can take notes in the margins and, and, you know, I dig deep when I get into something. Uh, but I mean, audio is here to stay and it's only growing. Exactly. And that's really what we're planning on. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, people talk about, I mean, the growth of podcasts. And, and sometimes people are like, well, it is so big and popular. I, I'm too late. I'm too late to the game. Um, Never. But it's not late at all, is it? No. It's really, the game's just getting started. Hmm. Could someone like me with a show this old turn around and start selling subscriptions? You know, I don't know. Uh, we haven't really made that move with an existing show. Normally, with existing properties, we'd like to do audience research first. So go in, talk with audience members, see what they're interested in seeing more of from the show, see what kind of content they like from the show, and then how we can productize that and sell that back to them. How do you find the audience members? Because that's, that's, that's what's always kind of bugged me with podcasting, right? Is, uh, yeah, some people will subscribe, uh, but I mean, we don't get 
kind of like selling through Amazon, right? It's like, oh, woohoo, I made a bunch of sales, but it's like, I don't know who bought it because Amazon keeps all the info. Yeah. So we do a couple of things. One, we're really big on having websites and email lists associated with shows because that gives us much better detail into who's listening. Well, for sure. But I mean, you still have RSS feeds, right? And things from your host. Like I use Libsyn. Um, if somebody's just subscribing through Stitcher or whatever, you don't have yeah. their contact info. Right. And so what, we're, what we do is we're going to use call to actions embedded in the show sure. to try to push people over to those secondary options. Yeah. And we're going to try to grab somebody through a social pixel or through another social media post we put out. The hardest people to reach are the person who gets recommended the show by a friend. And then they never hit your website. They never hit anything. They just subscribe through an app and start downloading. Right. And we're lucky now that attribution is starting to come online for podcasts. We're getting some of that retargeting information now. We're getting better demographic info. But to actually get in front of, to speak to those audience members, there's a lot of work involved. We still got to have a way to find them. Yeah, I'd, I've tested different things uh, and they work. Like I'll, I'll offer, in the past, I'd offer my free um, or a, a PDF copy of my sales training flashcards. You know, I mean, I sell the physical copy for 20 bucks. And if people leave me a five-star review, send me a screenshot, you know, I, I'll mail them a PDF of that. So I've done different things to, to capture the names of, of folks. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I know who is listening. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's hard. Uh, I mean, I, I know some of these guys, man, they'll, they'll make like a transcription. They'll do all like, I mean, major work for each individual episode to give unique content. And uh, I mean, I don't know if I want to work that hard. <laughs> yeah, we try to keep all that pretty standardized. That's why we're so big on repurposing is if we know we're creating a show where we create the podcast. And then that's going to get some light show notes. And then two weeks later, it's going to be posted as a blog post. And that that podcast is going to get rolled up at the end of three months with the other five best performing shows into an ebook. And we know all that from the start. It's a lot easier to plan everything out and know how it all falls together. And it saves quite a bit of time and money. Yeah. So you take the transcription and turn it into an ebook. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, normally we'll end up taking the transcription, turning it into a blog first or yeah, an yeah. extended show notes format and then use those to take the highest performing ones and create an ebook. Yeah, actually, I've been thinking about that, doing that right now. Um, like cause as I approach my 400th episode, um, it'll be, I mean, this year I'll hit 400. Like, well, let me pull it up. Let's take a look, shall we? Yeah, let's uh, do it. When is that coming up? So it'll, so August will be 388. So August, September, October, eh, probably by Thanksgiving, I'll hit 400. Um, and although like right now I'm at a pretty hectic pace that I am going to slow down. I mean, right now I'm doing like, uh, I throttled it back to f one every four days. I need to get kind of back to one a week, but, uh, we've just been busy lately. Um, so let's say 2019, I hit 400 and I've been thinking about like getting, um, consolidating just the high points and, and putting it. I mean, even if I just did one episode per page, right? That's a 400 page book and people probably don't want a 400 page book. Uh, but if there's pictures and, and bite-sized nuggets, takeaways from each one, you know, you can get through it quickly. Uh, I'm actually doing like a, a full on book, uh, instead of just an ebook. Um, uh, what do you think about that idea? I love it. I mean, I, that's when you say you've got 400 episodes, my first question is, have you published a book around this yet? Right. Because you, if you pick hey, your Don't best, shame the guest, okay, man? It's not, it's not a good thing, man. Don't be making me like, if I cry on my own interview, that's, I may not, I may not publish this one. Oh, well. well <laughs> <laughs> if you cry on your own interview, that'll make for great content. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on, man. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got to do something with it. I know 15, anywhere from 15 to 30 episodes is what you'd want to pick out of that batch. 
and then really narrow down, you know, pick out your best episodes, the best couple dozen, and use those to create the book from. Yeah. Now, fortunately, I didn't transcribe all of them back in the day, but I guess I could always just take the audio and hand it over. Or There's tools like Zoom now transcribes this automatically, and it's pretty good. I mean, it needs to be cleaned up, but it's considering it's part of the service at no extra charge. I mean, that's a great value. Yeah. And we use Otter, which syncs with Zoom. So every time we do a cloud recording on Zoom, it pushes straight to Otter. Or we just upload to Otter uh, afterwards. That's Otter, Otter. Otter like the animal? Yeah, dot .ai is the website. Oh, cool. It's like so 70 or bucks a year for unlimited transcription. Nice. And how do they charge? Uh, annual. Oh, no kidding? Yeah, I think, I, think we, I think it's 80 bucks a year for up to 100 hours a month. Yeah, here we go. So 833 per user per month build annually. And that gives you, whoa, 6,000 minutes per month? <laughs> yeah. That's legit. You can get it free for 600 minutes a month? Yeah. Is Transcription has really gone to zero in cost for the automated stuff. Oh, man. Yeah, for real. Because I've seen, I've seen different ones out there. And, I mean, what was it, rev.com or something? One of those was like a dollar a minute. And then I found one for 10 cents a minute. And now you're talking free. Woo. Yeah, so a dollar a minute's the sort of the industry standard and rev.com is the one who set that pricing for a human transcription. Uh, so at a dollar a minute, I expect it to be 99 or a hundred percent accurate. But once you get down into the, you know, 20 cents, 10 cents or free, then you're using automated. And so the big companies who are doing all the AI work these days, they're just about giving away credit on their platforms to get more information through for the transcription. Oh, I see. So it's building up the, um, the algorithm basically. Exactly. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. So, so down the road, they'll probably be charging. I mean, I'd imagine it'll remain zero as the cost of computing power goes up. The cost for them to actually transcribe goes down. Right. Or sorry. I said that wrong, but I think the message got across. I know what you mean. Yeah. No, that so, was right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, man, I'm going to check that out. You have it syncs with Zoom. That's awesome. Now, do you, so you, do you just use them or do you kind of compare Zoom versus them or and that might be redundant, huh? And be more of a pain in the butt. Yeah. We just use them. Uh, yeah. I know that somebody's going to be listening to the episode on our team, probably a time and a half or two times speed. Right. Uh, but, at the end of the day, I know that anything that goes out the door is going to have the right words in it. And so yeah. as long as we've got a semi, a pretty accurate, searchable version of the transcript, it makes things much easier for us when we want to go back and pull quotes later. And do you take all of the content? So do you take that transcription and make it content on the blog post itself? Uh, so it's searchable or is it just a free download people have to opt in for? So that's a case by case. Okay. Um, we do some clients where the transcript is the download and we do that with every episode. So you've got show notes. If you want to download the complete transcript, click here. We, I personally prefer not to release the transcripts. And so I do pretty detailed show notes for myself and okay. That's what we post with our company uh, podcasts. Why, why do you not want to release it? So I like to save them because we're going to reuse parts of them later. Okay. Um, and so that's really a personal preference thing. Just to create more exclusivity kind of feel. Yeah. yeah. And my personal belief is that Google is transcribing every piece of audio on your sites, regardless of whether or not you ask them to, and that they know what's in those. Um, that just seems like a no brainer for me if I was them. Right. They're everywhere, huh? Yeah. There's, I've been seeing positive results from posting podcasts with no transcript in SEO for over two years now. Hmm. Uh, so that's, that's something we've been tracking quite heavily over time. So when you embed the interview, 
Um, you're saying Google is actually following that link through and listening? That is my belief, yes. Yeah. I don't have any direct proof to back it up, but all the surrounding evidence says, yes, this is happening. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. I mean, they have, uh, with Echo and everything else, uh, they certainly have the ability. Uh, yeah. And why not? Uh, I mean, just like any kind of crawler, right? I mean, they're crawling and reading your site, so them crawling and listening, it's not really, really any different. Yeah. It's a different form of content, different medium, right? And they do that for YouTube already. Yeah, for sure. Man, I remember when they bought YouTube, it was like, what, what, what's going on? Are they really that smart? Should they be spending that much money on it? Kind of like when Facebook bought Instagram. You're like, uh, yeah, they're that smart. <laughs> yeah, they both have turned out to be fantastic moves. <laughs> what about, uh, golly, I'm not a fan of these whole Avenger series, but golly, what, did, oh, yeah. Disney bought them, right? Yeah, Disney owns Marvel. Yeah, uh, they spent, what, $4 billion on it, and then... And then they made like what 1.2 billion on the opening weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's uh. So it's, it's like, yeah, uh, I guess these guys with big bucks uh, might know a thing or two about um, where to focus. And when you see what they, when we see the numbers that Disney posts from their subscription uh, streaming service that they're launching, that's where the real win comes in for them with Marvel. Oh, what are they doing? I haven't even so thought of that. Disney's setting up its own Netflix. Oh, gotcha. But just for Disney stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes and sense. And so all the Marvel content's going to get pulled down from Netflix when their contracts expire. And it'll oh, gotcha. only be accessible on the Disney platform. Right. Man, content is king, isn't it? It's, it's funny. I'm, I'm actually getting ready to write about how content is inherently worthless at the same time. It's, all right, elaborate. So... Content is king, yes, from a marketing perspective, from a branding perspective, you can't put out better stuff than content. It's going to outperform ads over the lifetime almost every time. Unless it's a Super Bowl. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> I, I don't know about the Super Bowl. Yeah, they may not get an ROI, but people do tune in. You know, it's the old adage, uh, and I always quote Howard Gossage. Oh, it's Gossage? Oh, yeah, I think it's Gossage. You know, he said, people don't, don't read an ad. They read what interests them, and sometimes it's an ad. Yeah. I think ad makers, marketers, just they create bad content. You know, it's all me, me, me focused. And, and so, yeah, they don't, yeah, that ad didn't work. But it doesn't mean the medium's bad. It means you wrote a bad ad. Exactly. And that's but anyway, what the were core you of content is right. creating content that appeals to your audience. It's the research that happens first. So how but can content be king but be worthless? So it's worthless from an economic perspective. Um, what do you mean? As soon as you create content and digital content, I can copy, paste, and distribute it another time. It has, from, uh, it has no inherent value. All the value in the content that you create is in the entertainment it provides to the reader yep. or in the education it provides to the reader. And if they already know that information or if they are not entertained, it does nothing for them. So. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I don't know. Are you splitting hairs? I mean, no, when you say true. content is king, I guess the implied assumption is good content, valuable content. Uh, and now more than ever. Yeah. Pete, we're in the uh, engagement and entertainment age. Yeah. So you better be, you, you better know how to capture their attention and keep it. You know, but hadn't that, hadn't that always been true, at least since the internet came in, at, at least since social media came on? I mean, yes. you could get away with boring stuff. I mean, there have always been shows launched, even when there was just the big three, right? Shows would launch and be canceled if they weren't any good. Yeah, and that's, that's still part of it, but the cycle is faster. Oh, for sure. And if you're putting out, you know, that ebook, that ebook download that everyone has, you've got to make sure it's got real value in it and that that value is understandable and viewable before somebody downloads and reads the ebook. So what yeah, do, I, I mean, even, even a few stuff. years ago, people were more willing to opt in for something uh, just on the off chance it was decent, but now yeah, we're just, our BS meters are on 
they're more sensitive, right? Yeah. The assumption is that it's worthless. You have to prove the value. So how do you do that? How do you do it before they've even opted in? So we put it out there for everyone to see. Any one of our ebook downloads at Call for Content is entirely accessible in web form online. You can go look at the whole playbook. We call them playbooks. They're on our site. You can go look at it. It's got a table of contents. It's all right there for you. But if you want the PDF, we'll take an email. If you want the added workbook exercises, we'll take the email. But all the content is there available for you to see and for you to understand how it might be useful for you. So our goal with the content we put out is to get somebody in conversation. We want them to ask right. questions. Well, yeah, for sure. Now, but you were saying earlier that you would not give the transcription, like you would hold it back. Um, but now you're still saying you put out, you put a chunk of it out? So uh, it's different kinds of content. Okay. So for the eBooks we produce, for the playbooks we produce, uh, that go in depth and explain a single strategy on, for example, our authority marketing playbook is about positioning your business for authority and start getting started on partnerships to expand your brand. Our B2B podcasting playbook is focused on developing a podcast for business to business lead generation. And so we've got these playbooks that are really in depth on specific channels and those are open and free. Okay. But then the more entertaining content, the podcasts we put out, that's focused where we have the podcast and then we have the show notes that are the highlights and we reserve the transcript for use in some other format later. Gotcha. So we, we kind of approach the repurposing for each channel a little differently. We approach the way we give and restrict access to the content for each one. Um, and, the w and the reasoning we do that is because we're looking at where is the value in this chain? Because we assume that all the content has no value until something happens, until we have some indication that the person is finding value in the content. And then we can navigate and recommend and get them deeper in and capture them with content that has real value to them. Because right. the, as I'm sure you've noticed that that statement, you know, content is inherently worthless. That's, that's as much buzz as content is king. Right. Uh, content is worthless until you put it in perspective, until you put it within the relationship of you, the content creator and the knowledge you have and the experience and what the audience is doing on the other side. So once we put it in the frame of the relationship, we can find the value again. Right. I like the way you think. It may be time to experiment with uh, charging for the podcast. I know it's one guy I follow. He actually he turned his podcast off. He brought it all in house. He kind of, kind of followed that model. Uh, yeah. And it was, um, I kind of miss him. But, uh, you know, I think it's working for him. Yeah. So it's the magic uh, numbers we see are around 2000 for business audiences and 10,000 for broader audiences on podcasts. What do you mean? You need 2000 subscribers or downloads or what? Yeah. Uh, I, I look at some, I look at audience totals. Okay. So we take all the different analytics and metrics that we're getting everywhere. And I've got some tools that I've built internally to help us get a better idea of what the actual regular audience is for a show. Okay. And so then we use that number rather than downloads per month or anything like that. But you can, you can do a rough comparison between the two. But it's, so you're looking for, like in B2B, what, like 2,000 regular listeners? Yeah. If it's a show that's not been monetized. If it's a show that has no services attached, that has no revenue opportunities attached, then we're looking for about that 2,000 regular listeners number to go in and develop either products to monetize, services to monetize with, or to look at sponsorship. Right. Okay. 
That's cool. So 2,000 for B2B and 10,000 for B2C. Yeah. Okay. Good. Interesting metrics. Thanks. All right, man. Well, where do we send people to learn more? What do, what do you want them to do, huh? Go to callforcontent.com and let's chat. Uh, I've got on the website, it's C-A-L-L-F-O-R-C-O-N-T-E-N-T.com. Okay. Uh, that's call for content. Um, you can, if you go to that homepage in the bottom right corner, there'll be a little chat widget that pops up and says, would you like to book office hours? And if you'd like to talk with me, if you want to chat podcasts, talk content, those office hours are exactly like the office hours at university or anywhere else. They're free. They're open to my audience and they're there for me just to talk with people, learn more about what you're trying to do and make sure that we're still creating the content you want because the people who work with us, they come to us wanting to work with us and everyone else. I just want to make sure you put out good content because I don't want to see all that bad shit. There is a little bit of bad stuff out there. I would tend to agree. And these office hours, are they, is it a group call? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? What is it? It's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, oh, wow. Normally I've got, got a couple slots open each week uh we've got time every day but my schedule books up uh right. i think i think we've still got some open for next for the next couple weeks uh right. since the summer's a little slower for us okay but yes they're free they're open they're one-on-one -on -one. it's 30 minutes me wow. and you uh and if you just want to talk about bread baking i'm happy to do that as well you're a weird man. Come on, dude. Thanks. You don't want to talk about bread baking. I actually, I got one of my favorite clients now uh, because we were talking about bread baking and we were both bread bakers. And there's a lot you can learn from bread about how to create a better business and create better <laughs> content. <laughs> oh, yeah? Give me one. Give me one tip to leave our listeners with. Patience. Um, <laughs> no. No. Get right to it. Tell me now. <laughs> so you make the best bread by doing what's called a preferment and letting that sit for it. Yeah. So that's a mixture of yeast, wheat, and flour okay. that's made a couple days in advance of creating the actual bread dough. So it gets complex flavors and that's how you get real professional quality bread. And similarly, you got to make sure you create your preferment for your content you want to start putting out little snippets of content, interacting with your audience early on before you even consider a dedicated podcast or continuous channels. You got to, you got to know the flavor you're looking for. Uh, I guess y'all, it could be also the six P's, huh? Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what we go for. Begin with the end in mind, all those kind of good things. Yeah. All right. All right. Very nice. Well, Michael Greenberg, all the way from Denver, the baker. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast, man. It's been great. Thanks for having me, Wes. Been a lot of fun. All right. Have a great day. You too. My biggest regret about podcasting is not sticking with it when I first started in 2009. And I'm glad I've stuck with it since 2013. Uh, it's a great way to get the word out. It's a great way to give you fresh content regularly. Uh, it's a great way to get access to great people. Um, I've always said, you know, this is like me getting free consulting from all these people. I've always been able to just pick the people that I want to talk to. And for the most part, uh, I've never been turned down. You know, I, there's been a few with a little bit of an attitude and I just haven't followed up with them. Uh, but people say hello. They, they reach back. And yeah, podcasting has grown. Uh, if you try to get all the same big wigs, there may be um, a line uh, even me publishing these every four days, I'm booked out over two months. And so, you know, you get some top celebrity or whatever, it's going to maybe a little harder to reach them. So try zigging when everyone else zags. Use this to target the people you want in business. And I'll be making those changes later in this year uh, as I get more strategic uh, about who I go after. Uh, I want to slow this down a little bit, get to every five days, maybe every seven uh, ideally, I'm going to get to doing more book reviews, uh, things that I like 
uh, books that have uh, piqued my interest and books that have changed my life in sales and give you, you know, my take, my spin on that uh, and go after uh, bigger businesses, people that you may not typically hear from, uh, but they're people that uh, I can land as clients as well. So I'll be, I'm working on that, but again, I, I'm two months into the future already, uh, and that's at, at four days. So it takes a little while to get moving, uh, changing the direction when you've uh, been so entrenched like this, but hey, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but you should look into it, uh, consider reaching out to Michael. Uh, if you've got any questions, you know, you can join the implementors.com. It's my free Facebook group. You can ask questions there, continue the conversation, uh, and have a true conversation, right? Because right now it's very much one directional. So I'd love to hear from you. You know, um, leaving a five-star review is a big help. Subscribing is a big help. Uh, it boosts the numbers. As the numbers go up, I can reach more people. Uh, greater chance of turning those into clients, which helps me put food on the table for that five-year-old you may or may not have heard screaming in the bathtub. So I appreciate your help. Thanks for tuning in. As always, go sell something. <laughs>